Hello, good afternoon. Uh, it's me, Paul Nixon. Um, I'm uh, going to tell you today about uh, your Scottish military ancestors or, and, uh, and where you can find information about them. So um, first of all, I want to uh, go back a month to the broadcast I did uh, on photographs, uh, looking for clues in military photographs. And um, I, it's a subject close to my heart, um, as are most things military for that matter. Um, but I had some great responses and thank you for all your questions and all the comments uh, on Facebook afterwards. I, I did go in a day or two later, actually, it wasn't the same day, um, and answered some questions and, uh, and I was pleased to see what, what people were asking. And, uh, and as a result of that broadcast, I had some great responses from uh, three individuals in particular who I want to call out now. So it's a surprise to all three of them. But anyway, um, a drum roll, first of all, for Graham. Uh, Graham, thank you very much. Uh, Graham uh, went out to an antiques fair, a postcard fair, a couple of days later, I think, a week, week or so later, um, and was looking on the backs of photos, military photos, and, and found some that were named and thought of me and bought them and dropped me a line and said, would you like them? And uh, so I said, yes, please. Thanks very much. So so those, those are from Graham. Um, don't get too dizzy, Graham, watching your name spin around. Uh, so thank you for those. And I look forward to more uh, emails, conversations with you. Kath Topping, uh, your name is increasing there, Kath. Thank you so much indeed for those uh, photos that you sent me, Second World War photos from, from the, the family, uh, all those digital images, uh, most of them named as well, which would be great in uh, hopefully helping other people uh, find their ancestors in the future. And finally, last but not least, uh, to Jackie Nesbitt, um, who lives just up the road from me in Colchester. Uh, I'm, I'm in Chelmsford, so Jackie's not a million miles away. Um, uh, Jackie sent me digital images and also some some postcards in the post as well of different people um, which I've been poring over and trying to make sense of. Um, so there's more work for me to do there, but but what a fantastic collection and, and thank you so much uh, to Jackie. And again, thank you to everybody who uh, responded to, to last month's uh, presentation. So uh, moving on to this, this month's presentation, we're looking at Scottish... Um, ancestors and where to find records and, and although it's it's titled Scottish and there are there will be talk about Scottish regiments of course um, much of what follows is relevant for Welsh ancestors or for English ancestors or, or you know, people in, in various different corps or regiments uh, because we're looking at sources of records where, where you can find information what's out there uh, why we won't find some records um, and what's still to come so at the moment, you can see there, everything that's highlighted in bold on that list uh, is available online. Um, service and pension records, medal rolls, index cards, prisoner of war, soldiers' effects, some regimental records. Soldiers' effects isn't a find my past um, collection, but, but nevertheless, it's out there and is, is, is useful. And then in addition to the material that you find online, um, you'll also find information in muster rolls and paylists, most of those are at National Archives, regimental histories, many of which I have on my shelves, um, magazines, uh, regimental museums are a great source, and the MOD from 1920 onwards, um, they have the service records and papers for service personnel in, in all arms. But on Find My Past, you'll find uh, a, a large collection, uh, really, if you add everything up, um, and you can find your ancestors in in various, uh, it's a jigsaw puzzle. I've said this many times before, but it's a jigsaw puzzle. Um, you, for those of us who, who have ancestors, I've got five. My grandfather and his four brothers all served in the First World War, so so five Nixon brothers. Um, the one who was killed, Jack, he has papers in W0363, slightly damaged. Um, and Edgar, who was in the Royal Flying Corps, has papers in, um, in the Flying Corps records in, in Air 79. But for the other three brothers, nothing at all. Um, metal index cards, metal rolls, um, I think a casualty listing, but that's pretty much it. So in order to find information about them, it's a case of piecing together the disparate sources and trying to construct a, a service history. And that's pretty much what all of us have done or have to do for those of us uh, who have ancestors who served in the British Army or, or for that matter, to, le to a lesser degree, I suppose, in, in the Royal Air Force and, and, the, and the British uh, Royal Navy, because those papers uh, do survive, although there's, they're less detailed than, than the um, army records that you'll find. But, but nevertheless, on Find My Past, there's a lot there. You've got the service records, medal index, card index, silver war badge, the same, 
um, so, uh, service and pension records for the First World War, and then all those other uh, collections there with ticks against them, plus all the, all the regimental records, so Coldstream Guards, Artillery, Royal Wash Fusiliers, and so on and so forth. There's, there's a lot of information there, and more being added all the time. Uh, the, the War Office uh, the, in London um, uh, is is where is is the hub, administrative hub of the uh, of the British Army, I, I suppose. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the attestation process, what uh, soldiers went through uh, when they when they first signed up. And this process didn't really differ very much. Um, it, it, was, it was certainly processed a lot more quickly during wartime. But essentially, this the service of each soldier was recorded uh, on his. Uh, attestation paper uh, and that was completed twice so you had the original attestation which was sent to the officer in charge of records and the duplicate attestation which was sent to the man's commanding officer um, when it came to the man's final discharge the um, officer in charge of records would receive receive the duplicate attestation and check it with the original and rectify any discrepancy so so in theory if you have if you're lucky enough to have the duplicate and the original of the attestation paper it should be the same information recorded on both uh, you will often find um, minor differences, but but in some cases, honestly speaking, if you looked at them, you'd have trouble. It's almost as if you're looking at a photocopy because it's almost identical um, you know, to the handwriting and, and the positioning of the of the words on the pages. Um, we'll look at uh, duplicates and originals again shortly. As part of that attestation process as well, an army medical form was completed, and you can see this uh, recruit here being tested. He's looking... He's looking directly at us and imagine us being that chart that you have on an optician's wall. We've all done it, haven't we? We see those letters and you have to read the letters out. That's what he's doing. And the man behind sitting at the desk is, is recording the results. So typically, and this, this uh, paper here isn't for this particular man, um, but the vision is recorded on that medical history form, which is Army Form B178. Um, and you can see there the vision recorded for the left eye and the right eye. So let's look at where you'll find information on soldiers, Scottish or, or otherwise. But um, if your man served in the militia, um, then there'll be papers in W96, which is what we're looking at there. It's a militia, militia attestation paper. Um, W96 is for other ranks only. Papers were collected to determine uh, an individual's eligibility for pension. Um, so if he died, he won't be in that particular collection. Um, and the papers, papers here are mostly four page or often actually three pages that have been written on and, and therefore digitized. Um, but despite the paucity of information in W96, the paper itself is quite detailed. So you get the parish the man was born in, uh, you get his age, you get where he was living, you get his employer, uh, the employer's name. Um, and so you get that get that useful information. And often on, on page three, uh, where the man leaves the militia, um, it will say went to join the regular army and and so even if a paper doesn't exist for his regular army service you'll know roughly when he joined the regular army and you'll be able to roughly work out the regimental number he must have been given if obviously it states the regiment that he joined so so it's a good source of information um and you know for that matter on some papers there are more than just the, the attestation the attestation paper but for the most part it is just that attestation paper it's a similar story with W97, which is uh, the, the papers for that we used when men joined as career soldiers. So typically, um, men joined for 12 years service, uh, a combination of seven years with the colours and five years on the reserve, although that period of, of that term of service did vary over the years. Um, so from 1902, it became uh, nine, and, nine and three, so, uh, sorry, three and nine, three years with the colours and nine years on the reserve. Um, but in this case here, the example here is seven and five. So uh, again, papers were, were saved um, uh, and, and kept to um, in case of pension claims. Um, if, uh, if your ancestor went on to serve uh, with the same regiment during the First World War, then he won't be in this collection. You probably find this paper in W363 or, or 364. And again, most of these papers in W97 uh, are just the attestation papers, although some of them also include medical history forms as well. And, and those forms can be particularly helpful because as well as finding out what your ancestors' ailments were, it was the practice for men to be, uh, to, 
for an entry to be put on the paper when a man arrived at a particular station. So if he was, let's say, stationed in Glasgow and then um, moved uh, across country to Edinburgh, then you'd have Glasgow written on there, then Edinburgh, uh, you know, a day later. Um, and when he sailed, set sail for foreign climes, the ship would be recorded on there and also the date that he landed. So you can, by using the information in these papers, if you get enough of them and look at enough records, you can work out where a particular battalion um, of a regiment served. And I find that very useful. Um, information is available for different uh, battalions uh, different times but but often as not you can bet your bottom dollar that the, the regiment you want information on you can't find it so so there is a way of doing it as i say go through go through these service papers um noting locations recorded on soldiers documents make a note of the the date the place um often as i say it's because a man moved from one station to another but you'll also find details of hospital admissions as well and so each time if a man was in Chelmsford for argument's sake um, and was admitted to a hospital five times over the course of two years then that will be entered five times on that form plus you'll also see why he was in hospital what the uh, remedy was uh, how long he was there etc so they're very detailed uh, forms well worth looking at uh, W363 is the burnt documents, so-called burnt documents, um, and the reason that they're called burnt documents is clear to see on this paper for Charles Savaran. Um, millions of papers were destroyed during bombing in the Second World War on September the night of September the 7th and 8th, 1940, uh, where the warehouse in Arnside Street was destroyed by German incendiary bombs. And um, the, the destruction of these papers is the least of it, really. There was so much uh, material destroyed, including part two orders for for regiments which are which are great because they really they give the comings and goings of men in the battalion postings they're very very detailed you will find some actually part three orders in part two orders in w363 but it's it's the luck of the draw if you find them there's many papers uh, inserted in the w363 series which appear to be randomly inserted and may not be for the man that you're looking for but amongst those you'll find lists and you'll find often um lists and pages from uh, part two orders so they're well worth finding uh well, well worth uh, saving when you uh if you do come across them and and for that matter if anyone does come across them and you, and you feel so inclined please drop me a line and tell me just send me a link um i i generally try to save them when i do find them similarly i would save lists of uh, prisoners of war but if you do come across part two orders uh, while you're looking at w363 i'd be interested um so uh, so that's W363. In this case, it's for Charles Sabaran, who's not a Scotsman, um, and I've researched him. And there's, if you just Google his name online, uh, you'll find plenty about him. And, and I've mentioned him, for that matter, in other presentations. He's um, he, he's interesting because there's a paper in 363, which is what you're looking at, and this one in 364. Um, so he has papers in both series. I mean, he did lose his leg on the first day of fighting, uh, so he, and he claimed a pension for life, but. What I was saying earlier about the original papers and the duplicate papers, if you look at the, this paper in W0364, you can see the word duplicate written uh, on the left-hand margin there. So this was the duplicate copy. So, so when he signed up, that burnt one we looked at a minute ago was filled in first, and then this one was completed um, just after that. So let's just go back and compare that. There you go. So you see his signature. So that's the signature in two places here and here. Um, and his name has been written there. That's his, that's his writing. Uh, actually, that's his signature there, isn't it? That that, uh, that writing is his, is his signature. And then if you go to the next page, there again, you'll see it. C, he's written it C. Sabarin there and Charles Sabarin there. So there's the difference. 363 is Charles Sabarin. And then on this one, he's written it C. Sabarin. Perhaps he got fed up by the time it came around to the duplicate and couldn't be bothered to write his name in full. But, but anyway, um, the papers are... Are useful uh, you will have you said that you're you're less likely to find attestation papers in 364 it's more often than not um, casualty form active service um, the, the pension forms the, the document that soldiers signed when they were leaving the army are you going to claim for a pension yes or no and, and often they did um, it's those sort of documents you're more likely to find in 364 but there's still enough there to be able to piece together uh, information about the man's service um so that was other ranks so all, all those w96 and 97 and then 363 and 364 are other ranks um, w76 is officers services to 1914 um 
not not nearly as complete as the other ranks papers we've just looked at and really provides just an outline summary of service but but obviously the, the longer the service a man had the more information there'll be there um, those men who went on to serve during the first world war will generally have surviving papers at, at the national archives but not necessarily the service papers because they were again destroyed in the bombing in, in the second world war um, what you will find in those files and that's in um in W374 and W339 for the First World War for, for officers, uh, you will find often um, an attestation paper if a man had uh, been promoted from the ranks, that original paper might be there. But there's also often just correspondence between various Whitehall departments and, and, and correspondence about pensions. It, and it's, a mix, it's a mixed bag. In fact, I've asked... Um, a researcher chap a friend of mine uh, who's based near Kew to, to pull some papers for me for a for a man uh, that, that I'm researching um, and I have no idea what will be in in his particular file it might it might be half a dozen pages or it might be a hundred pages I don't know and, until I see it um, and that's the thing with the records as well they're not digitized they they are available at National Archives they can be ordered they can be photographed if you happen to live near Kew and I don't um, but it's it's accessible but but it's a five hour trip round trip for me. Um, if you happen to be close, you can go in, you can order the documents, you can photograph them. But um, if you can't do that, then there are researchers who will do it for you. And that's that's what I that's what the, the path I tread. So um, let's look at the first case study that I'll come across today. Uh, so this is uh, 7162 Alexander Burns of the Black Watch. Um, I bought his medals over a decade ago now. Um, in the early days of my medal collecting, I think I liked, was attracted to this because he was an old contemptible um, and he's also served in the Boer War as well. So he's, it's a multi-campaign group um, and it was mounted as worn by him. So that I found attractive as well. But he was, uh, his number was 7162, he served with the Black Watch. And I, of course, started looking for him on Find My Past. And, and the way I do this, I look for him in uh, in service records, and then I would look for him in, in all military records. So I could do an all military search, or I can do a service record search. And, and in this case, I, I started with service records. So you go to all records, type in uh, British Army or service, and, and you'll see the collection appears. That's, there it is at the top. Um, his name is Alexander Burns. Uh, I typed in his birth year. Um, I'm sort of cheating here because I knew uh, through other research that he'd been born in 1881, but um, but I wouldn't necessarily have to put that, that year in for that matter. I mean, I might surmise that if he was fighting in the Boer War, which began in 1899, that he was probably not born for 18 years prior to that, so 1881. 1881 uh, or, or earlier so that's a that's an, a good guess you know you could put in here you know 1880 with a five-year give or take or 1880 with a 10-year give or take for that matter um, but anyway I know he was born in 1881 it just narrows it narrows it down for me narrows the options down because the, the name is fairly common um, and then I could if I wanted to also filter on the series of records as well um, if I'm not sure what, what the records are actually telling me, I can go to the Discover More About These Records section on Find My Past, and that will tell me um, more about the records. Um, so in this case, Coldstream Guards and uh, Scots Guards. And I can filter on the record collections as well. So if I was just wanting to look at First World War records or just wanting to look at um, records in W96 and W97, I could, uh, I, I could click on those boxes accordingly. And as it turns out, uh, there is nothing for him in W97, and, and there's nothing for, as you would expect, because he served in the Boer War, but then went on to serve in the First World War. So you would expect that any papers that survived for him should be in the 363 or 364. But there's nothing. The only the only paper that does survive for him is in uh, W96, which is a malicious service record, um, and that's uh, gives his birth the year there as uh, 1880. Uh, his Regimental numbers two, three, five, nine, and the Highland Light Infantry, and that's the paper for him. And as I say, it's it's helpful because it tells me where he was born, where he was living, where he worked, um, 
And there are, for that matter, other records that survive for him. There's a medal index card, there's a medal rolls for the Boer War and the First World War, the Silver War badge, um, which he received, um, and the pension card on, on Fold 3. But there are no uh, actual service records. Um, and I couldn't find him in any roles or, or newspapers that are currently published um, on the British Newspaper Archive or Find My Past. But it's better than nothing, you know, there's something there. It's, it's another jigsaw piece. And here are two more pieces. So the Silver War Badge roll, which says he was discharged early. He was discharged in August 1915. So uh, 1915. So by by August, he was out of the army. He'd he'd been wounded. Uh, he he'd appeared he'd been he'd recovered. He'd appeared before medical boards, and he was discharged. So it suggests he was wounded somewhere before. Um, so uh, discharged as a result of wounds. And then the pension card below. Um, which, as I say, is a Fold 3, uh, part of the Fold 3 collection, uh, gives additional information as well. Date of discharge, uh, same as on the Silver War Badge, year of birth, 1881, uh, and also an address, 17 King Street, Perth. And in this case, um, his defective vision was aggravated by uh, war service. So, so a pension claim appears to have been made in respect, not of, the, uh, of his wounds, but defective vision, Unless, of course, the wounds was you know, affected his sight. I don't know. It could have been gas, blinded by gas, or partially, partially blinded by gas. And that information, I don't know, uh, but it's possible. Scottish rifles. Um, I, I I don't have any connection that I know uh, with with Scotland. Um, I love Scotland. Uh, I've got many Scottish friends. I've been to Scotland many times, and I would holiday in Scotland in a heartbeat but I have no no personal connections with Scotland as far as I know the Nixons are all solidly Londoners um, although the name doesn't originate from London and the other side of the family is Suffolk and London it's pretty much rooted in the southeast I have no Scottish ancestors but but I am fascinated by the Scottish regiments um, and my interest tends to uh, tends to be stimulated by the material I have uh, at hand and an early uh, or a fairly recent publication, I suppose, certainly within the last five six years, was a was a book um, on the Second Battalion of Scottish Rifles when it was based in Malta. It was largely a photographic book. Um, all the officers are named, and this photo uh, isn't from that book. And I can't remember now whether it's of these men as they were departing Malta or arriving. I would imagine. Well, there's some of them wearing tropical helmets. There's all sorts of dress being worn there. Uh, I should go back to my notes and find out. And, and probably if you clicked on that link, you'd find you, it would tell you what uh, where they were going, where they were heading. But they're heading somewhere. Um, so all the officers lined up, all the troops on, on the ship. And these are all officers from the 2nd Battalion of Scottish Rifles, uh, the Cameronians. Uh, and the tragedy of this is, is that many of these men would be killed. Uh, others would be wounded uh, at the uh, Battle of Neuve Chapelle in early 1915. But, you know, it's a it's a snapshot. It's a moment in time. So there they are there. And this is how uh, this is some more of them here. This is the officers, uh, some of the officers at the front uh, the, the, and sergeants uh, at the back. Typical photos. So most senior man in, in the middle, then fanning out officers either side of him and then uh, sergeants behind. And here they all are. The officers again, uh, all of them in Malta. Uh, and they're, they're all names, not not in this particular shot that you're looking at, but um, but they are all named uh, in the original. And I want you to look at the the man in the second row here where my arrow is. I don't know whether you can see my arrow on, on, on your view of this screen, but uh, he's there. Uh, if I go back, uh, where is he? He's there as well. Uh, so, so second, uh, fifth from left. And he's on here as well. Where is he? Let's find him. Uh, can't see him offhand. He is on there. there. Um, not there. But anyway, he's so. So there are three separate um, photos of him in in with the Scottish Rifles. And when he was killed in February 1915, he appeared in um, De Rubini's Roll of Honor, which is where that biography comes from. Um, there's another photo of him down there on the right. There's a grave photo of well, as well of him. It sort of supports my view that if your officer, if your ancestor was an officer, and if he was a public schoolboy, and if he was killed in the First World War, and particularly in the early stages of the First World War, 
you're more likely to find a photo of him, and, and so it is with this particular man. There are lots of photos. His name was Captain Wilfred Innocent, uh, Maunsell of the Second Scottish Rifles. Um, he was captain and adjutant of the battalion. Um, and after the war, his father applied for his medals. Um, officers, anyway, had to apply for their medals, um, and next of kin had to apply uh, in respect of those officers who, who were killed. It's always struck me as a bit, bit strange that the other ranks were sent medals automatically, but if you were an officer, you had to apply for your medals. And so was the case here that he, his father, applied for his medals in 1918, um, and they were subsequently sent over. So you can see every, all the detail on there. Uh, the form form has been sent, a nom nominal role has been sent of officers so that they could check whether he was eligible for the 1914 star, and he was, because uh, he, he embarked on the, or disembarked on the 5th of November 1914, um, and so all the information is there. Um, and that's the book that I'm talking about. It's, uh, it was published by P.G. Everard, um, based in Paris, and they, they appear to have gone round to that publisher appears to have gone around various regiments at different stages, certainly over a period of uh, 15, 15 to 20 years, um, photographing the men, um, officers, officer groups, sergeant groups, uh, various groups, but all the men in the battalion were photographed. And these books uh, are not common. Um, say the Scottish Rifles, this one I had uh, bought in as part of a lot of auction some years ago, and was very pleased when it when I picked it up and saw just how rich it was. And then earlier this week, actually, um, I saw this book appear on a bookseller's catalogue and immediately uh, bought it. And it, funnily enough, it arrived today. Um, here it is. Um, it's, again, similar format to the Scottish Rifles. Um, on the back, you've got uh, there's a Maxim Gun detachment. It's a very, very thin book, not many pages. Um, but it's full of useful photos. Uh, I shall digitize that and I shall be publishing those photos on uh, my British Army Ancestors website. Um, and hopefully people in due course will find their ancestors and, uh, and will come forward. But it's a tremendous record of, of the time. And the, as I say, these books are not, uh, are not common. So as we continue our search through records to look for our Scottish ancestors, um, the Scotsman used to publish casualty lists daily, uh, as did the Times, as did, as did the Irish Times. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, the Scottish, the, the Scotsman uh, um, sorted the, the casualties in order of Scottish serving personnel first, or Scottish regiments first, and then it published um, information on other regiments. The Times and the Irish Times, I believe, uh, all published the information uh, in terms of regimental precedence order, which is which is fairly standard. So you so, so you publish regimental precedence. It's killed in action, died of wounds, died, etc. So you, so the, the men who lost their lives publish first, and then you repeat the process regimental precedence order for wounded men and then missing, etc., etc., and so on and so forth every single day for for years on end. Um, the the photo on the left doesn't come from the Scotsman. It comes from a, another uh, publication which I. To my shame, I haven't uh, credited the source, but it but it does come from another publication. Prisoners of War on Find My Past. I've talked about these before in, in other presentations, um, but just to say that there are, you'll find plenty of Scotsmen in these uh, Prisoner of War records, including the man here, Thomas Hughes, who's the man on the left. Uh, the fact of the matter is over 180,000 British Army officers and men were captured uh, by the enemy during the First World War, and around half of those men captured in the uh, in the last six or seven months of the war arguably though i think the greatest impact was felt by the british army in 1914 with um, the equivalent of 24 battalions worth of men and then these are these are not um, kitchener recruits or territorial force men and i'm not downplaying their role by any means but these were regular career soldiers well-trained men um, who were well-trained men for the most part i mean some of the, some of those men who went out in 1914 would only have been in the army for a year if, if that but but they were regular soldiers drilled as regular soldiers and, and their loss must have been severely felt the equivalent of six brigades of soldiers being captured 
So Thomas Hughes on the left is a good example of that. He was uh, he joined the army in 1904. Uh, he was uh, arrived in France on 10th of August 1914, and he was captured within six, six weeks of arriving in France and spent the rest of the war in a prisoner of war camp. Uh, he, this photo dates to uh, is unknown. Date is unknown, but but it uh, it was taken in Berlin, and I bought it uh, some some years ago, and it's um, now sits in my collection. Thankfully, he. Put his name on the back which is why i know uh, know his name and that's fantastic for anybody who's uh, related to him who would happen to stumble across his name in future they'll see a photo of him so for the prisoners of war records uh, on find my past you need to go to the prisoners of war collection obviously uh, so go to the main search page um, then look for the uh, search all records type in prisoners uh, and you'll find the prisoners of war collection Scroll down to discover more about these records, and you'll you'll see uh, see it all broken down there by the conflict. And then within the conflict, you've got uh, details of the piece numbers. So this is series numbers and piece numbers for the National Archives. So um, moving forward, uh, we're going to look at a prisoner of war from the Second World War, and then we're going to go back to the First World War. But but anyway, here's Robert Lewis Robert Anderson. Uh, I bought uh, the Father Son medals. Uh, Lewis Robert Anderson was the son. He served in the, in the Second World War. His father served in the First World War. Um, Lewis, unfortunately, was captured in Singapore in 1942, missing, originally reported as missing, um, but then subsequently reported to be a prisoner of war. And you have all that information on, uh, on the Feynman Pass on the POW records. So you can see there that top one is missing on the 15th of Feb, later confirmed uh, prisoner of war that date. And then he died uh, as a prisoner of war in Malaya, uh, now Malaysia, on the 20th of May, 1943. So, um, as I mentioned, go back to the ICRC prisoners of war uh, for, for the First World War. These are records held by the International Committee of the Red Cross. That's what the ICRC stands for. Find My Past has indexed these records. We, we've indexed the, the records uh, for the prison camps, but not the uh, repatriated men. That were, they've not been published as of yet. Um, but uh, there's still plenty of records there. And as it says on the ICRC site, uh, during the First World War, 10 million people, servicemen or civilians, were captured and sent to detention camps. So it makes that 180,000 look like a drop in the ocean when you think of 10 million people in total. And you can search, although I always look for... Um, British military, there's British civilian and there's other nationalities as well, which you can search for on, on the site. It's a it's a tremendous resource and it's a free resource, but it hasn't been indexed. It, it suffers from poor indexing, um, which is the beauty of Find My Past's collection because it, because it has been indexed. So for deceased soldiers um, for 1914 uh, or up to 1914, You'll find medal rolls, uh, embarkation lists, newspapers, regimental museums, regimental histories, Boer War records, prisoner of war records, um, soldiers' effects, muster rolls, uh, etc., and also information on online forums. So, so although you won't find service records as such because these were routinely destroyed, again, it's that piecing together the jigsaw puzzle, looking at other sources of information. And for that matter, you might find men in several of those lists. So a man who appears in an embarkation list might then have gone on to um, serve in a, in a particular campaign, which would have entitled him to medals. So you'd find him in a medal role. Uh, there may be information about that in a museum. Uh, he might have been captured, therefore prisoner of war, etc., and so, so on and so forth. So it is a case of really ticking all the boxes there just to make sure that um, you've not missed anything. Um, and also to, to keep uh, be alive to what's coming up because, you know, we're not talking about a finite uh, resource here we're talking about uh, a website in find my past that is continually publishing records continually doing deals with archives continually making more records available and that's repeated um, across the net so not not just with find my past and yours so it's a as i've always said it's there's never a better time to be a family historian it's fantastic today but it'll be even better tomorrow and it'll be even better the day after so, so just keep alive to what's being published as well. Soldiers Effects Register, I've mentioned, not one of ours, but it is an important uh, source of information. Soldiers Trade is recorded in early records, uh, date and cause of death, next of kin, 
money's paid, um, creditor details, and whether the man died intestate or not. That uh, for officers, that is. Um, you won't necessarily find that on most of the First World War records. You'll generally see that um, uh, what the money that was paid to the next of kin at the time of the man's death and, and the war gratuity, when that was paid and the amount that was paid and the, the, na the name of the next of kin, sometimes it was split out across various members of the family. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's a useful information. And sometimes it will also say, give you information that's not recorded by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. So it might say that he died at a particular casualty clearing station uh, or, or information over and above what you can find on soldiers died or on uh, CWGC. So it's an important uh, record source. For deceased soldiers for 1914 to 1920, uh, you'll see all of the foregoing um, except the muster rolls and pay lists. Uh, you've got soldiers died in the Great War, Commonwealth War Graves Commission, De Rouvenier's National Roll of the Great War and official war lists. And for Deceased soldiers from 1921 uh, to the present day, again, Commonwealth War Graves Commission for the Second World War, and various published roles, um, regimental museums, regimental histories, etc. Um, Ministry of Defence, though, has all the service records and, and they are still held by them and will be um, for the foreseeable future. Um, but you can apply for those. You can, if, if you Google Veterans UK, um, you will you'll come to the MOD website and you can apply to view the records. So it's a, it's a two-step process. So the first stage is to fill in the information about yourself. Uh, wh where do you want the information sent to? Uh, you've got to have to write a check for 30 quid as well. Um, and then information about the man or woman you're looking for. So it's a, so it's a bit of form filling. Um, but then and then you and then a lot of patience because the MOD is currently saying uh, it can take up to 12 months to send that information through. Scottish soldiers' wills is a is a useful source if if the soldier from the First World War um, mostly um, died. Uh, it covers the period eighteen fifty seven, so that's Indian Mutiny time up until nineteen sixty four, and it's published on Scotland's People. Um, but it, so it includes the Anglo South African War, First and Second World Wars, and the Korean War as well. Here's a topic um, which is definitely worthy of, of a further presentation and um, probably from a Scottish uniforms expert. Uh, and I'm not a Scottish uni uniforms expert, I'm, but I'm an interested observer. Um, there's a lot of information that can be gleaned from old photographs. You know, from, in this case, where you can see all the arrows coming in, pointing to different aspects of this man's dress, from the tartan to the Glengarry to the Sporran to the the regimental badges uh, on different parts of his uniform it's uh, there's the, there are lots of clues there and our ancestors particularly our victorian and edwardian ancestors were well photographed and commercial card companies um, must have made a fortune uh, selling these cards because you find loads of them on the market and and lots of variants of the cards as well um, so here you've got the same two men obviously uh, photos taken at the same time different treatments by the cards and possibly different publishers as well. So the one on the left is colour, although it probably existed as, as black and white originally. Um, and as I say, these cards would have been published in runs of thousands and then republished and uh, published with a fancy border. Um, there are no end of these cards around. So that's fantastic news for us because it's great reference uh, that we can use to see how our ancestors lived and to see the type of things they wore. Um, I've said this now and I'll say it again about sporans, different types of sporans uh, used to identify regiments. It's it's a, a source of study in its own right, really. And you've got three, uh, four rather uh, pipe majors here or pipers from the Highland Light Infantry over different periods of time wearing different uniforms or different types of uniform. So let's look at the Scots Guards briefly. Um, you can impress your friends and family next time you watch the Trooping the Colour on TV and you see a man with three buttons in the, in the formation that they are on the left, you can say, oh, that's Scots Guards. Straight away, I know that's Scots Guards. And, and it's because of the, again, the regimental precedence. So the first, uh, first, regiment, uh, first regiment of foot guards was the Grenadiers. 
uh, the buttons spaced singly. Then the next was the cold stream the buttons spaced in pairs. Then the then the Scots guards came third. Uh, the Irish guards were fourth. Uh, their buttons in grouped in fours. And then the Welsh guards uh, fifth uh, formed in 1915. Their their buttons grouped in fives. So it's an easy way to tell quickly which guards regiment you're looking at. Um, and again, photos are plenty. So the man on the right, um, I believe I've researched him. Uh, I can't remember his name offhand, but but it's a, it's a tremendous photo. Um, post Boer War, looking by, judging by the medals on his tunic, um, and a great study, Sergeant Major Scotch Guards, it says there. Um, Scots Guards is the correct name, of course. So here's another one of uh, my medal groups, uh, which I bought a little while back. Uh, this is Private William Robertson. That's not him on the right. That's that's a colorized um, Crimean War veteran, uh, not not William Robertson. But I, but the medals on the left are, are owned by me, and and I just think they're they're lovely. I, lo I love the uh, oak leaf clasp, um, and thankfully there are some records for him that survive uh, in W97. Uh, he was Private William Robertson of the First Scots Fusilier Guards, born in Banffshire in 1833 and enlisted in 1851. Uh, he was discharged in 1855, having been wounded at Inkerman. And his his papers state his entitlement to three clasps, Alma, Balaclava and Inkerman. Um, but the Sebastopol clasp was subsequently awarded after he'd left the army. So, so although at first sight it looks as though he'd added a, an extra clasp for himself, um, he was entitled to the four clasps. And that's just what I wanted when I was looking for Crimean War medals. I wanted a group with uh, all four clasps from a, from a good line regiment, and I certainly got that with with him. So, so that's a prized possession. Uh, he received a pension of eight pence uh, a day for life. And there you can see uh, the papers that survive for him. You've got the attestation paper on the left, um, all the details about him when he joined and then on the right uh, as a bonus you really you've got the discharge papers as well here's another photo from the scottish rifles book um so the scottish lowland regiments uh, were, were non-kilted regiments they wore trues and this is the um as i say scottish rifles in malta uh, but the pipers in all scottish regiments wore kilts which is why you can see those men there with wearing kilts There's a superb study here of all the different kinds of dress worn by this regiment. Again, coincidentally, 1st Battalion Cameroonians. Um, this from Portsmouth, when they were stationed at Portsmouth in 1894. Um, you look at all the dress, all the different forms of dress there. I love the the wet weather dress, um, which is on there. I can't see it for looking now, looking at it. But there, it's, it's fantastic uh, clothing. Uh, you've even got a bicycle on there. And the, and the boy there as well. And thankfully, this um, this particular photo was named. It had the names of the soldiers as well. And, and as a result of that, I was able to identify some of the men as well. So you've got Pipe Corporal Wilson in review order, um, Edward Goat. So the numbers weren't originally recorded on the uh, on this photo, but looking for for these surnames. And, and as usual, it's the odd surnames which help you find the man. Uh, you, you've got Lance Corporal Edward Goat, George Ellison and John Ladkin. Um, all those men I've been able to identify from this photo. It's a great study. For the Highland regiments, uh, the sporran designs changed over time. Each regiment wore multiple sporrans. Uh, so, for example, commissions, commission ranks had one, the pipe major another, etc., uh, etc. Et but identifying the, the sporran and tartan will lead you to the regiment. And so there's a few examples, a couple of examples coming up. Black Watch, uh, Royal Highlanders, uh, as was 1881 to 2006. Um, this is the history of the regiment, really. I mean, from since 2006, they've been the uh, third battalion of the Royal Regiment of Scotland, so th three Scots. But um, they have a very distinctive spore in there, which you can see. And the Argyll and Southern Highlanders is possibly the most... Uh, Interesting, that's probably not the right word, but um, well, I suppose easily identifiable 
sparring for officers anyway um and senior ranks you've got the the badger head so officers and senior ncos wore the badger head sporran on badger head on badger hair body so if you're a badger in uh, in that part of scotland you want to keep a low profile um the six goat hair tassels with gold cord suspenders were worn by the other ranks and there were gilt mounts embossed with thistles so again very distinctive sporran And the Gordon Highlanders, uh, white horsehair front uh, with two black horsehair tails, gilt brass engraved holders. And you can see on the left, you've got the uh, VF is Volunteer Force, Officer Sporum with red purse. And on the on the right, you've got the officer and other, rank, other ranks Sporum. Again, all these photos, uh, incidentally, uh, although I'm showing them as part of my collection, they're, they're from, I think this one's from the Transvaal, uh, Transvaal in Peace and War. Um, from postcards, from clippings in the Navy and Army Illustrated, various sources, really. It's not difficult to find the reference. Um, recruitment in Scotland. The map on the left, I'd love to have one of these maps. Um, I've got a number of posters from the First World War recruiting posters, and, and this is one. Um, and if I can ever find one uh, for sale, I'll, de I'll definitely buy it and pin it up because it's very useful as reference. Um, my wife would love that, having a map of that hanging up in the house. But anyway, uh, I'd have to do it when she's not looking. Um, it shows you where the different regions of Scotland, uh, the regiments, where, where they where they were. Um, so you've got the Seaforth Highlands up in the, up in the left, and then the Gordon Highlanders, Cameron Highlanders, etc. Um, it, it's all quite clearly spelled out, and it's interesting to see on the right um, how that has uh, evolved over the years. So so now many of these regiments, of course, no longer exist as regiments in their own right. They they, they exist as battalions within a larger single regiment um, so but you can see there that that's uh, light blue uh, which is the royal highlands or the, or the highlanders rather um the fourth battalion of the of the royal regiment of scotland you that covers all the area that was pre, pre, uh, formerly covered by the gordon highlanders the cameron highlanders and the seaforth highlanders um and then below that the royal highlanders the black watch um, DC Thompson country really Dundee um, that's now the Black Watch is now the third battalion so it's so it's interesting to see how that has uh, has evolved but as well of course as purely Scottish regiments don't forget also that your Scottish military ancestor could have served in in the militia and special reserve for, for all line infantry, not necessarily a Scottish regiment. And then and the same for the volunteer force and the territorial force. And, and for that matter, there were also Scottish battalions in non-Scottish units. So the London Scottish uh, was the 14th London Regiment and the Liverpool Scottish was the 10th King's uh, Liverpool Regiment. Um, but then you had also Scottish New Army battalions like the Tyneside Scottish, and uh, which was the 20th to 23rd Northumberland Fusiliers. So yes uh scotsmen served in scottish regiments irishmen served in irish regiments englishmen served in english regiments but but all those nationalities could have served in any regiment for that matter so uh, but you can and, and the beauty of farmer pass is that you can search across everything you don't need to restrict your search you can restrict it and, and narrow it down if it suits your purposes but but you can search across all regiments or all military records Uh, regimental museums can be a, a gold mine. I remember going to the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders Museum up in Stirling in Stirling Castle some years ago um, and looking at the archive there and being fascinated. They do have part time or part, part two orders there in that museum um, and, and much else besides. Um, I should think they need to employ somebody full time just to polish the silverware in that museum. There's so much of it, but it's an incredible resource. Um, but you can find a list of the regimental museums on the Ogle, uh, Army Museum's Ogilvy Trust website. Um, there's currently a large digitization project underway, which may so soon see more records released. But uh, typical things you'll find, as I say, in these museums are enlistment registers, nominal rolls, medal rolls, uh, etc., and um, regimental chronicles and photographs. So, so well worth checking in with. Um, to see what they what they have and, and the sort of service they offer. And as I say, click on that link um, for Ogilvy Trust, Army Museum's Ogilvy Trust, uh, find that on Google and then follow it through from there. 
Um, photographs of Scottish soldiers, uh, you'll find some on um, my website, BritishArmyAncestors.co.uk. Uh, Over 100,000 photos there. You will find photos, uh, there's photos there from Lives of the First World War, which are on Find My Past as well. Um, and you'll also find uh, there's Farmer Pass has a good collection of Harrow schoolboys as well, for that matter. So if you if you were to go to the all record search and just type in Harrow, uh, you'll find the Harrow school collection, and there'll be uh, boys who who went to Harrow school uh, who subsequently joined the army as well. And the, those are very good quality photos that are on the Harrow school site. They're they're, they're from glass plates. So that's it from me. Um, Please put your comment, comments in the uh, in the comments section if if you have uh, if you'd like to leave anything if you want me to come back to anything um, I'll do my best to answer any questions as as always um, thank you for listening next month I'm talking about the British Army in India again a subject close to my heart um, and so I look forward to catching up with you all then bye for now.